Hello and welcome to this episode of Triggered and True featuring renowned emotional health consultant, Laura Duncan. Thank you for being here and thank you for investing the time to learn how to take care of your soul. If this podcast sparks any questions, feel free to submit a question by going to triggeredandtrue.com, scrolling to the bottom of the page and clicking ask. If you would like to learn more about Laura Duncan, we encourage you to follow Laura on Instagram and Facebook. Also, a great resource for you to consider is the Compassion Method Master Course. This course is a deep dive into Laura's life work, the Compassion Method. The Compassion Method is a process that empowers you to learn to see and comfort your internal pain and to discover your true self, your true self, that beautiful, wonderful part of you that has been there all along, but has simply been covered up. To obtain the master course, go to CompassionMethod.net and as a podcast listener, you qualify for a $50 discount that can be obtained by typing in the coupon code PODCAST50. Again, that's CompassionMethod.net coupon code PODCAST50. We hope you enjoy this episode. So thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of Triggered and True. And on this episode, we are going to be talking about the trigger of faith and religion. So everyone, or most everyone, has some element of faith, whether they realize it or not. So about half of our country professes a belief in God, and a significant amount of those who do not profess a belief in God, when something bad happens, they pray to someone. And um, don't you find that interesting? I really do. Yeah. I mean, you kind of, you kind of like when um, I heard that fact, I was like, that makes a lot of sense that, you know, especially in moments of pain, I think we either we pray or we blame, but I think we definitely connect to something bigger to us, bigger than us when we're going through hard things. Yeah. Yeah. So faith and religion can be very triggering for both the religious <laughs> and the non-religious. Exactly. So we're going to be talking about the triggers kind of that both sides of that equation experience. However, before we do that, for someone that might just be jumping into this podcast kind of midstream and they haven't listened to all the episodes or don't have any other exposure to Q lore or the compassion method, briefly explain again what a trigger is. So a trigger is a irrational response to a rational or irrational circumstance or person. And I always emphasize that because a lot of times, if it's something externally, whether it's a person or a circumstance, if it's something small and we have a big reaction, most people identify, oh, I'm triggered now. But when there's something really big, and as in the topic of religion, there's a lot of really big issues that have happened, not just right now in our time, but in the course of history, there's a lot of big events that religious uh, people have facilitated and hurt other people in. And those are really big events. So when I have a really big reaction to those external things, it feels justified because those events are so big, I should have a really big reaction, but it's still an irrational trigger. It's or still a trigger and it's still a reactional reaction, ugh, irrational response <laughs> to a, even though it's a rational situation, it's still a trigger within me. And we want to be able to be okay, regardless of our external world. And that's something that's really hard to do when we have big emotions connected to religion or any event in our life. Yeah, and a lot of people consciously or subconsciously, their goal is to, when something triggers them, they're like, well, in order for me to be okay, I just need to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I need to either fix it. And if it's something I can't fix, I just get rid of it. So why is that not a good strategy? So when we, when we blame our external world, we blame people or people groups like we're talking about today. We blame people. What ends up happening is we neglect the pain inside of us. As I continue to blame others, I leave myself bleeding, vulnerable, with a wound and a pain that started long before I ever experienced this event or this person. And so when we're able to stop blaming, even if it's justifiable and start taking care of the pain that's causing us to have the reaction in the first place, then we're able to actually properly take care of ourselves in a way that trying to get rid of blaming, um, suppressing our external world is not going to be able to take care of. 
I think a lot of people would take exception and, and probably a lot of people do when they first meet you take exception to the fact when you have something that's rational, like you said, religion, yeah. and you think of crusades and you think of mm-hmm. just all these crazy so things that many things yeah. happen throughout, throughout human history that have been wrong. And they would say, well, no, it's perfectly rational to be this upset, to be this not at peace when something yeah. big happens. So whether it's about that or whether it's about a coworker, that's just a jerk, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. You're like, well, if the coworker wasn't a jerk, then I could be okay. Yeah, so, exactly. So a lot of people would take offense and they'd say, no, it's the coworker. Get rid mm-hmm. of the coworker. I get rid of the problem. Yep. Get rid mm-hmm. of the religion. Get rid right. of the problem. Get rid of the problem. Yeah. So, um, so when people take kind of offense to that, kind of how do you walk them through that? (laughs) Yeah, it's actually kind of funny because sometimes like the like kindest, nicest people get super offended by it because they have this sense of justice and they have this feeling of they're going to protect the innocent, which I love. And it's so important for us to have justice in this world. And what people do does matter. But who people are matters even more. And especially who we are in that circumstance matters even more. And so there'll be these beautiful people that want to bring justice and want to make change in the world and want people to be taken care of well, which I commend and I think is amazing. But when we, when I say it's still something within you, that's causing you to experience pain, that's causing you to react in this situation. Um, the kindest people will get so triggered by me saying that because they're like, no, this is, this is the cause. Like, this is the, the reason this is what I'm going to, you know, give my life for, which sounds so great. But if you've neglected yourself and you're trying to bring justice, which many times what justice is, is being able, wanting to go back to take care of our pain that nobody stood up for us in. And now we're going to go stand up for other people in that. And it's so important to first take care of ourselves, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you're able to go and help other people. So yeah, it's definitely a sometimes painful redirecting to stop blaming and start taking care of what's going on inside of our hearts because people feel like what's going on on the outside is so much bigger than what's going on in our internal world that we'd rather just have these crusades, have these you know, uh, missions that we're gonna go take care of all this injustice in the world, religion included, instead of taking care of ourselves first. Yeah. As I started to learn this, it was actually incredibly encouraging because I recognized how much energy I had put in my life to try to get the external world in order. Oh, yeah. We've been doing that from a very young age, trying to regulate our external world, which is impossible. Yeah. And it was very encouraging to learn that, hey, there's a way that I can learn to be okay, even when my external world is not. Yeah. And guess what? We live in a perpetual state of our external world not being okay. Exactly. It's we can only control a very small percentage. And even that is questionable. We really no. can only control ourselves at the end of the day. Very good stuff. So the other part that was challenging, but I've learned to, and I'm learning to look at these triggers, not so negative, but actually in many ways positive because they're an opportunity for me to take care of myself. So sometimes I even find that if I'm in the middle of something triggering, I'm like, okay, where's the opportunity in this? Cause it's an opportunity because it's bringing up something in me. That's a, it's a point of pain from my past, a point of unmet need. It's an opportunity for me to go back to that. You think it's all about the thing right in front of you, but really that's just, the icing on the cake or the straw that broke the camel's back. There's something much more deeper going on. So yeah, exactly. And if you think about it too, I mean, like putting that mirror in front of your own face to be able to see what's really going on inside of you to see, be able to see the pain that's causing us to react is actually what keeps us from um, not, it keeps us from being religious because religion says, I'm not going to actually take care of me. I'm either going to help other people or hurt other people based on the what's going on inside of me. So really the goal today is to help people understand that there is a why behind their trigger that could be connected to faith or religion. And there's a reason why it's there. 
and a reason behind the seemingly strange behavior that people exhibit around this topic of faith and religion. Again, those people that are religious people or would identify as religious people and the people that identify as non-religious. They both have triggers. They're just different. So, so we're going to start off by talking about some of the common triggers of the non-religious. And uh, one of the first ones that uh, when you and I were brainstorming that we came up with is that um, people of faith, and, and probably we're coming at this, you and I, from more of a Christian perspective, because that's more of our, our background. But I think a lot of this could apply to, you know, other, other faiths as well. So, so one of the big, one of the big triggers of the non-religious is that Christians or people of faith are very judgmental. And um, they have a tendency to make people, other people feel like they're not good enough and kind of ignites a shame storm. So you want to just expound on that? Judgment is really what self-judgment, it always is. So however a person's judging someone else for whatever reason, it's always going to come back to how we judge ourselves and how we see ourselves. And you mentioned a shame storm and shame says what you do is who you are. So if all the judgment that I give to my external world is actually the judgment that I have for myself, it's coming from me seeing myself for what I do or don't do. So now I need to judge others for what they do or don't do. And one of the popular quotes that I um, share is what you do matters, whether you're religious or non-religion, we recognize that our actions have consequence. And so what we do does matter, but we matter more. But if I, as a religious person, are preoccupied with what I do as being good or evil, which means now I'm going to be preoccupied with what you do as good or evil, then I'm going to bring judgment on what you do. And we can judge actions. I mean, even in like the court of law, we're judging actions. But the problem that comes in, and that's why we're so offended by judgment, is that we're not just judging what we do or what others do. We're judging who a person is. And that's potentially what triggers us, religious or non-religious, when others are judgmental around us. Because they're saying that it's not just what you do, it's who you are. And there's something wrong with who you are. And if you don't know who you are, that leaves you really, yeah. really vulnerable, right? Very vulnerable and pretty much limited to just what we do, because that's all we see. I mean, even think about when we're little kids, what do people say? What are you going to do when you grow up? What do you do? So everything's centered on what we do, not who we are. So it actually makes sense that we would be judging people for what they do because we believe that's who they are. Mm -hmm. So the to kind of identify the, the two sides of the judgment. So you have Christians who are judging others because in a way that's how they're judging themselves. That's like a mirror image thing going on. Yep. You, it almost feels like you get points if you judge other people because the more we can be righteous, self-righteous, the more we can judge other people for their mistakes. It almost feels like you get like points for it or something. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> I know that's not actually yeah. like a true thing, but like, it seems like it. Subconsciously that's kind of mm -hmm. going on. There's a, yeah. there's a score, there's a record keeping, a score yeah. keeping going on exactly. subconsciously. Yes. All right. So as a Christian, um, you know, a lot of times a, a Christian or a person of faith could fall into that, you know, unaware, but then what about uh, the person on the receiving end? Obviously everybody can be okay when this is going on. So how would you help someone that's really offended by the fact that someone else is judging them? Well, I would first start by offending them, <laughs> but <laughs> I wouldn't actually purposely try to offend them, but it does offend people especially when you have a really good case, like you were talking about how we build up cases on both sides, you know? And so what ends up happening is I just simply say, why does judgment bother you? Why does it bother you to be judged? And that sometimes offends people and triggers people again, because they have the whole list of all the reasons why it's so painful and so wrong. But really when you bring it down to, why does it bother you? Because we could say majority of people don't want to be judged, but why judgment would bother me and why judgment would bother you are going to be two different things based on our early childhood development, based on our own stories and our own history. 
to being able to explore why does judgment bother us? Why does it bother us to be judged? What would be some common reasons? Um, a lot, a lot of times it comes back to our emotional needs. I like to call them, um, gifts and we have a 10 gifts episode. If you want to understand more of what, um, emotional needs are, but think about it this way. So one of the needs, one of the gifts is to be seen. So if I'm only being seen, like I said earlier for what I do and people aren't seeing my heart, they're not seeing my intentions. They're not seeing my pain. They're not seeing my internal world. They're just giving a knee-jerk reaction judgment about who I am based on how I don't line up with their religious beliefs. That's going to feel painful because I know in my internal world, there's a lot more going on than just, I made a mistake. I did, I did the wrong thing. And so that's going to hurt because I feel misunderstood. I feel like I'm not seen. I'm not heard. I'm just my actions. And that hurts for all of us. Because we want to be loved unconditionally for who we are, not what we do. Well, hopefully that's eye-opening for those that have been the judges and then those on the receiving end of judgment. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah. And when, what do we do when we get hurt? We react. And you end up hurting others. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it goes both ways. I've used the example before. A really sweet puppy had a splinter in its paw you went over to pet it, what would it do? It would bite at you, bark at you, because it's in pain. But if you took that splinter out and you brought comfort to that puppy, it's gonna be the loving puppy that it was before. And that's true for both the person that's judging other people because of their pain and the person being judged that's experiencing pain. We're both gonna to react to each other and bark and bite because we're both in pain and we don't recognize that we have pain in our own hearts. We believe it's because of religion. When really the religion was just the gift that helped you reveal the pain that was there. So you can go about the process of bringing comfort. Exactly. Which is the most powerful place to be in. Because like you said before, we can't uh, control our external worlds. There will always be judgment in this world. There will always be religion in this world. And if we continue to blame it and not take care of our hearts, we'll always be underneath. It will always be subject to it. Kind of leads to our second trigger that we identified, which is really very closely related to the judgment. But um, another common trigger of the non-religious, of the religious, is that they're hypocritical. They're hypocrites because they oftentimes don't do what they say they should do. So you, you want to expound on that? That is a very popular because um, religious beliefs, Christianity um, has certain guidelines. You know, we have the Bible and the Bible has certain, what a lot of people look at as rules and certain things that we're supposed to be doing or not doing. And so for a person that doesn't live by religion, doesn't live by the Bible, they're like, I never said I was anything but what I am. But you as Christians or religious people, you said you are something and you're not acting that way. And so if you think about it, the, the pain of people being hypocrites is in some ways the same judgment that religious people have for non-religious people's beliefs or actions. When we feel like someone's being a hypocrite because they're not doing what they said they're going to do, we're still judging that person based on what they do or don't do. But I can understand how that would be so painful because you've said, this is what I believe. This is how I'm going to live my life. This is how I'm going to treat people. And then I don't act that way. But whether you live by a standard of the Bible or a standard of religion, we're all hypocrites because we all are doing things that are contrary to who we are, no matter what your moral code is or what your, you know, core values are for your life. Because at the end of the day, we all are never going to be able to be good enough. But we all have this expectation that we can. And so when a non-religious person is looking at a religious person that said they're going to do certain things that they're not doing, it triggers that pain. You're not who you said you are. You're not doing what you said you were going to do. And if you think about it, you go back to early childhood development, that's one of our biggest pains that our caregivers and our parents didn't do what they said they were going to do. And they acted contrary to what they said they were going to do. And that hurts deeply. 
because we trusted them and wanted them to do and say and be what we thought they were going to be. And that's true of, can I say, I mean, I, I can definitely say this, I believe that that's true of 100%. There is yes. not a single person listening whose parents didn't at some point not exactly. be able to deliver on what they yeah. said they would do or even what they if they did it 98% of the time, they did the very best they do could to do what they said they were going to do. Uh, you're right. It's a hundred percent true that at some point a caregiver or parent was not able to do what they said they were going to do. And that hurt. You know, speaking of judgment, you know, I would say that I'm not a very judgmental person, but I actually find myself being very judgmental towards religious people when they don't do, you know, like when I hear about a pastor that falls from in the sexual sin or whatever, prior to really understanding this, it would be very easy for me to hold that pastor to a much higher standard than someone who wasn't a pastor. And that higher standard actually really sets the pastor up for problems because now they can't be real. They can't be open, but this process has really helped because I don't see it as a moral failing anymore. I see it as that person must have really been hurting. Exactly. It's not well, all, I mean, like I said before, what we do does matter. So when we yes. make decisions like that, it matters. There's, There's consequences. consequences. There's messes people, that need to be cleaned up. Exactly. Yeah. That's all a hundred percent true. But my belief is, and I've seen it over and over again, if we were connected to our true self, if our needs were met, if our pain was comforted, we would never do those things because we have these wounds that we don't even recognize usually, let alone know what to do with it. We did recognize we're having these knee jerk reactions that are causing us to do potentially terrible things that are coming from lack and coming from pain. And so we can shame people all day long and say, you are the affair, you are the um, mistake you are whatever you did but at the end of the day if we don't recognize what's motivating it we can behavior management and try to be better people which got us to this place in the first place or we can stop trying to be better stop trying to be good and start becoming more of who we are that's separate from what we do yeah be more focused on bringing comfort and then remember how i said with judgment if if I have internal judgments for myself because I shame myself for what I do, then I'm going to have judgments and shame you for what you do. But the same is true. If I'm connected to my true self, and my heart is full. I'm going to see you in that same way, which is what unconditional love looks like. Yes. All right. The third trigger that we identified from our exhaustive searches that we did <laughs> the other day. We identified one where um, the non-religious often look at the religious as being very controlling or they feel controlled, you know, or attempted yeah. to be controlled by uh, religious people. I know this was, I can think of this in my marriage, our mar my marriage um, at the very beginning of our relationship where I was taking religion a little more seriously than my spouse. and. Mm -hmm. There was definitely that controlling part there and that <laughs> didn't go over real well, but anyway, mm -hmm. so um, just want to talk about some of the common things that can be behind that. Well, so if you think about it before you became religious and religion is ultimately a set of rules, moral, moral compass, you know, just, you know, you look, you learn that, oh, what I was doing before was hurting me or hurting others. And now I want to live by a certain standard and a certain way of life. So we take on religion, whether it be Christianity or any religion, and we live by those rules and those standards. And what that does is it's not just our relationship with God. It's actually our relationship with religion that makes us feel safe because before we felt so out of control. Now we have rules to control us and that feels safe because what we experienced before was scary, was out of control. We scared ourselves. We didn't know what we were going to do. Others scared us because we didn't know what they were going to do. And it felt very overwhelming, out of control, which creates a helplessness inside of us. And so when we came into religion, all of a sudden we found safety. 
Mm -hmm. Safety inside the boundaries of the rules. Exactly. And so that gave us actually a false sense of safety because rules, religion, we've seen over the course of history is never going to make us feel safe at the end of the day. Because like we already talked about, people are going to not do what they say they're going to do. People are going to judge us. People are going to shame us. We're going to experience those things in the midst of it. That's why there's so much pain in the church because everyone expected that we were going to get saved, that we were going to come into religion. And now everything was going to be perfect. And we're going to have the family we never had in our early childhood development. We're going to have those moms and dads. We're going to have the perfect church and the perfect religion that we can finally feel safe in. But then we realized they're a lot like us. They got problems. (laughs) Yep. Because every single person has pain and every single person is going to react from that pain. So it doesn't matter if you're in religion or not in religion. For those that don't consider themselves not religious people, you're experiencing it in your same groupings of people, regardless if you put a name on it or not, because we're all going to experience that false form of safety from being around people that agree and think exactly like us that makes us feel safe. What what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I can think about um, just some of the things as a parent of, of how I, as a parent, use religious rules yeah. to try to help control my kids because I was scared. Yep. I wanted to protect them and they were doing scary things and no, do this. Don't, don't watch that. Don't whatever, mm-hmm. because that's going to have a bad influence on you. And it's going to, and really, and it's not that as a parent that some of those boundaries and all those things aren't important is that I was not doing them offensively. I was doing them very defensively from a yeah. very scared, triggered place. Out of control um, yeah. feeling. So and what it do didn't we do come across very control? well. Right. It didn't yep. come across to them as love. Yep. Like, hey, my parent is trying to protect me. It came across as controlling because honestly, that's what I was doing in my mm-hmm. triggered, in my scared. Yep, exactly. It might have come with the best intentions because you love your kids and you want to protect them. At the end of the day, it came from your out of control that wanted to control them, not your belief in knowing that they're okay, that they need to be taught, that they need to understand things, but that they're not, we don't have to be scared that horrible, bad things are going to happen to them unless we control them. I mean, bad things are going to happen regardless, but if they actually, if their internal world's okay, that's going to be way more powerful than any external restrictions. Well, and a lot of what learning this process does is it builds empathy because you start to see that there's a why behind why someone's doing something stupid. And again, we're not excusing their stupidity, but we're just helping build empathy because you're like, hey, I've been there too. It's just that when I get triggered, it looks different. So maybe I don't get triggered and go do X, Y, or Z that, you know, we think is bad. I get triggered and I might go do something else that maybe even society looks at as good, but I'm still doing it from a triggered place. And it's not exactly. Yeah. Whether you're doing something good or you're doing something bad, it's a lot of times both coming from the same pain and the same trigger. Yeah. All right. Now let's take a little bit of time to talk about common triggers of those who identify as religious. So let's say you're listening to this, you identify as religious, and again, probably having an emphasis here on the Judeo-Christian faith, but I think a lot of this could apply to other faiths as well. But one of the big triggers of the religious is, um, we all kind of run into this at some point of wondering, is God who he says he is? So it kind of touches on what you talked about earlier, about early childhood development, and when a caregiver, you know, isn't who we thought they were, or that are doing things that don't match up with who they are. Exactly. So it's not even just, they're not doing what they said, but they're also not acting the way that we thought that reflects who we thought that they were. Yeah. So why is that so triggering then as it relates to our uh, person's relationship with God? So our relationship with God is going to always be impacted primarily from early childhood development which means that however our caregivers or our parents were able to treat us, both to love us and to meet our needs and to be with us, is how we're going to see God. 
And so that works in kind of the negative way that we're talking about, where if a parent is not representing God well, is not able to do what they said, or is acting contrary to who we believe them to be, then we are going to see God in that same way. And it's not just a belief system I'm talking about. It's actually neurological. Because how we see God is how we're going to see, um, how we see our parents and how they uh, were able to uh, give to us or be able to act in our early childhood development is how we're going to believe that God is. So if you feel like your parents never really heard you, you might have been um, trying to, whether you're uh, religious or not religious, you might have been trying to talk to God and feel like he never listens, he never hears you because your parents know how to hear you. So you're going to interpret that God doesn't know how to hear you either. And so you can see how both for what we want to receive from God, like you said in the beginning, when we go through hard things, people pray to God or blame God based on what they really wanted their mom and dad to be able to give to them. So as a, as a person of faith that's listening to this, if they want to have a deeper relationship with God, wouldn't you say it's very paramount that they take care of that? learn to take care of that unmet need. Yeah, exactly. Because until our heart's full, the lens that we're seeing God is always going to be distorted. Because we're seeing him from a heart that's poor, a heart that's in pain. So of course, God's going to look like the enemy. Of course, we're going to ask those questions. Why did bad things happen to me? Because we don't believe God was actually with us because our parents weren't able to be with us in our pain either. But as we have men and women, moms and dads stand in the gap for what our caregivers and parents were able to do or not able to do, and our hearts become full, we experience what that feels like in that example to be heard. Then when we start to pray to God, we feel like he's hearing us. Yeah, I want to reiterate for those that are probably wondering, well, how, how exactly do I do what she just said? <laughs> that would be the 10 gifts episode. That would be yeah. a great place to go Ten back and gifts, listen to yeah. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Because in the end of the day, you know, caregivers, parents are the tangible representation of an intangible God. And so when our parents weren't able to be that tangible presence of those emotional needs, then we believe that God, we might logically believe God can do those things for us as religious people. But at the end of the day, when hard things happen, when the storms of life happen, we really don't believe that he's going to be there for us. That's why people that are religious, a lot of times fall away from their religion because like we said before, it feels like God isn't who he said he is because we didn't have that example through our parents. Yeah. And one thing too, that I've heard you say before is that, you know, as children, we needed our caregivers to do what they said, but as adults, we don't need people to do what no. they say in that same way. Not even God. No, exactly. Because what ends up happening once we have received what we needed when we were little, because we did need our parents to do what they said they were going to do so we could survive. If a parent didn't feed us when we were a baby, we would have died because we, need, we were dependent on our caregivers to take care of us. And so we needed them to do what they said they were going to do to survive, both on an emotional level and a practical level. But as adults, our sophisticated adult brains are developed, and now we know we have resources, we have options. If one person couldn't do it for us, we can find someone else that can help us with that. But as, as children, we don't have that same luxury. So we do capital in need parents to do what they say they're going to do in early childhood development. But the beautiful thing is we get those needs met and we become adults. We don't cap, we would like people to do what they say they're going to do, but we don't have to have them do what they say they're going to do to feel okay. That's a childhood wound that we're still trying to get met as an adult. And that's why we get so upset with hypocrites and people that aren't doing what they said they're going to do because we're still trying to get that need met. And that's not just the non-religious being upset with Christians being hypocrites. Religious people are just as upset with people being hypocrites because it's telling them they're not going to get what they need. Yeah, that's tough because that goes back to if we're relying on getting our external world okay to be okay internally, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's never exactly. going to happen. We're never going to no. be at peace. We're never going to find rest. We're exactly. never going to find joy. Yeah. It's just like our parents never could do everything that they said they were going to do. Our, our spouses, our children, our peers, our pastors, our leaders, 
are never going to be able to 100% do what they say they're going to do. So we're always going to be triggered by that until we know we can be okay, even if people don't do what they say they're going to do. Yeah, and as a and as a person of faith, you can be okay even if God doesn't do what you perceive God mm-hmm. should do. Yeah, that's where it gets exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can relate that back to my own story. And I think I've shared this somewhere along the way, but just how when my husband wasn't healed, when he died of um, ALS, um, God didn't do what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to heal him. And when I read the Bible, it sounded like he healed people today. But then when I, and then I would see, I was in an environment that a lot of people did get healed. People I knew personally that I saw x-rays that I saw that were actually healed they would get healed and Jeff wouldn't get healed. And so I had this wrestle going on. Why isn't God doing what he said he was going to do, what he's doing for others? Why isn't he doing it for Jeff? Why isn't he doing it for me? And how I reconciled that is I recognized that what God does matters. God said in the Bible and God said in relationship to us, that he's going to do certain things. Um, and what he does does matter, but he matters more. So my emotional attachment to him for so many years was to what he did. So if he did something good for me, I would draw close to him. And if he did something bad or something that I perceived as not what I thought he should be doing, then I pushed him away. And I also perceived that when I did something bad, God pushed me away. When I did something good, he came close to me. So you can see how it's such a conditional temperamental relationship. I do good. He likes me. He does good. I like him. He does bad. I don't like him. I do bad. He doesn't like me, but the temperamental conditional relationship. But when I recognize that my emotional attachment is to not what he does, but to who he is, I was able to stay connected to him regardless of what he did or didn't do. And regardless of what I did or didn't do, we could be connected all the time because what he did or didn't do was less important than who he was to me. I think what you're describing, obviously you're talking about your relationship with God, but what you're also describing is the relationship relationships in general throughout all of time. Yeah. Our relationships yeah. with our children, yeah. our spouses, so how, mm-hmm. how often times they end up being that way. Pain makes relationship conditional. Compassion, comfort, needs being met allows us to have unconditional relationship, which is a very, very powerful thing regardless if we're religious or not religious, we can have relationship. So the second trigger that we identified of of those that are in faith are very similar to you. We've already really hit on it, but when bad things happen to good people, because that shouldn't happen, right? Well, that's also making an assumption that there's any good people, (laughs) because now we've lumped the world into good and bad people. And who Mm -hmm. really is defining that? Who defines that? No. Yeah. So um, when we talk about that uh, as being a trigger, it goes back to being rooted in shame and the knowledge of good and evil. So could you just explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I always think about like, why do uh, bad things happen to good people? And, you know, you said like, how do we judge good? Well, a lot of times I think about children because children to me are defenseless. They're helpless. They, as far as brain development, they're very helpless to, you know, their environments and even just them being innocent children. So I wouldn't necessarily say that they're good because children make mistakes too, but they kind of like are the epitome of like innocence. So when a child is abused in whatever form, to me, that's like the ultimate injustice because a child should never experience that type of pain. And I firmly believe that even as we're talking about how what someone does, it doesn't have to determine our internal world. It's still Like I said, what people do matters. When children are abused, it matters. It's actually a disservice to the child to say that the abuse or the things that they've experienced is bigger than who they are and bigger than them being able to get what they need even in that situation. So of course, obviously, I don't want any abuse to happen. I don't want bad things to happen to innocent, whatever you determine innocent to be. But I also know how powerful a person is, whether a child or an adult, that they can get proper comfort and care. They can get their needs met. They can come back to their true self 
and that the abuse and the pain that's happened to them doesn't have to determine their life and doesn't have to determine their identity of who they are. Because when I think that's, say, a, that's yeah. a big thing you're hitting on is identity because you're, what yeah, you're saying is that exactly. people can become the identity of a victim of abuse. And that exactly. Can, and we, so we see ourselves a lot of times as the victim of whatever abuse we experience. And, and please, everyone that's listening, keep in mind that abuse is never okay. I'm not saying it's okay by any means, but it makes me just as sad for someone to experience abuse and that to become how they see themselves as their identity or how others see them and their identity. And when it becomes, your, when pain becomes your identity, when abuse becomes your identity, then we stay stuck and why do bad things happen to innocent people, to good people, instead of recognizing that who that person is separate from the abuse or the pain that they've experienced. And so, for example, like when my kids have gone through pain in their life, which they definitely have, they lost a dad at a very young age. And then just even in this life, you're going to experience pain. Instead of blaming their dad's death, instead of blaming the hard things that come into their life, the bad things that happen to their life and teaching them to blame the bad things that come into their life. Instead of asking, why did this happen? I help them know who they are and help them strengthen their internal world so that regardless of bad things happening or bad things not happening, they can always be okay. So I guess it's almost like I'm saying a different thing. Like, it's not just like, why do bad things happen? But we can spend so much of our lives blaming bad things happening to us or others and not recognizing the extraordinariness that's inside of each of us and the, and the lack or the pain that's inside of each of us that needs to be taken care of because we're so busy and preoccupied with the question, why does bad things happen to good people? Well, I really like what you're talking about is not letting their pain prevent them from discovering the beautiful people that they are. Exactly. You can't be a victim in that. There's so many victims walking around saying bad things happen to me. I'm a victim to God. I'm a victim to my circumstances. I'm a victim to this. And of course, those circumstances are so painful and so difficult to go through. But you, the person who we are is more powerful and bigger than whatever we've experienced. So instead of focusing on why do these bad things happening, why do these bad things happen to us? Let's focus on who we are. Let's focus on the pain that needs to be taken care of so that regardless, we can be okay. Because I don't think we're ever gonna answer that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. That'll be a question we'll probably have until we die, but I can still be okay even if bad things happen. Yeah. And I think the, the last trigger we were going to talk about has more to do with those that may have a tendency to be more of a self-blamer because mm -hmm. some people will blame yeah. when bad things happen or whatever. They may blame um, their external circumstances, but then some people blame themselves. And I know I fall more into that camp. So, so, so a common trigger and the one that I came up with when we were doing this that I have around faith is, can it really be this good? Is he really there? Is there, is it, could it really be that good? And, and I think that's hard for me because I know I live, I live a lot of my life with kind of this impending cloud of doom hanging over my head. Like don't want to let the good get too good or something joyful happens. I'm going to throttle that back because there's something bad right around the corner. And somehow I'm preparing myself for the bad thing by not getting too joyful. Yeah. That's super interesting. Really quick side note. Don't hold your thought really quick. Um, so like people that were raised thinking like nothing bad would ever happen are super like, I can't believe bad things are happening, but then your early childhood development coding must've had like hard things happening where you expect bad things to happen because your experience says that's not, um, if a bad thing is going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. Yeah. And I don't know that you know, when I look at my life, I don't know that I experienced, there's a lot of hard things I did not experience that a lot of other people did. And that's a great example too, because it's real or, real or perceived. So exactly. I perceived a fear of bad things happening. And exactly, which could be just as detrimental to you as someone having the bad things happen. Yeah. I still have that to this day. I mean, that is still, that is the still part of that. Feeling. Yeah. yeah. So that's where I think about, I read these things 
that around the Bible. And I'm like, I sure, but not, I can't really be that good. <laughs> I mean, that just sounds too pie in the sky, you know, but um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, but really the pain of that, that I've recognized is a, a feeling of, of being kind of unprotected and alone that I got to figure it all out. And mm -hmm. that if something bad prepare does for happen, everything, yeah. So I'm going to prepare for everything. I'm going to be super prepared. You know, I, yeah. sometimes that, I mean, it, it comes across so logical, rational, and even, mm -hmm. even good, you know? Um, yeah. Wise. Yeah. Yeah. Good it comes. Steward. Yeah. Like, Hey, he was prepared for that, you know, and then I get in the business of, of risk management. So I can do that for my <laughs> clients too, you know? So, yeah. um, but, but at the end of the day, it is, there is definitely a trigger there, even though it manifests as in positive ways. And for me, it's taking care of the pain of feeling unprotected, feeling alone yeah. and commonly, that pain. Yep. Commonly unprotected and alone equals over responsibility because no one's going to take care of you. So you have to take care of yourself real or perceived. So you wouldn't believe all of the contingencies I play in my head of like, well, <laughs> how can I stay one step ahead of that problem? You know, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the act of imagination lives out those experiences as if they really happen. So you're experiencing all the traumas that you're trying to protect yourself from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to kind of wrap ourselves up today, kind of in conclusion, how would you, how would you like to summarize today, Laura? You know, I think I want to summarize it by just saying whether you're religious or you're not religious, we all have the same internal world. We all experience pain. We all have unmet need. We all have things that cause us to look at our external world, look at the religious world or the, or the non-religious world and have this pain that comes up. So this isn't a trying to change your belief podcast. This isn't trying to prove that you should be religious or not religious. This is trying to help you understand what's going on inside of your heart, that you could be okay anywhere, that you could walk into a Christian church as a non-religious person and see people, not religion, that you could walk into a mosque and see people and not religion, that you could be around anyone because it's no longer about what they're believing or what they're doing. It's about who they are. Yeah. It applies to everything. I mean, politics, you could yep, walk everything. into the opposite Anywhere. political party convention and be okay. Exactly. And how powerful is that? And yeah. how at peace is that? And how clear-minded is that? And how okay can we be in any situation? You've described that feeling of being okay in any situation as a superpower before. <laughs> yeah, it totally feels like it because before I'd walk into those situations and I would be fearful and I would be unsure and I would feel out of control and I'd feel overwhelmed. And I still get triggered sometimes, but for the most part, I can walk into any situation and be at peace, regardless if people are doing things or acting in ways that are contrary to the ways that I think people should act or the way I think people should do things. And the really neat thing is this is a superpower that we can all develop. Mm -hmm. Regardless of our belief systems, because mm -hmm. we all have emotions, we all have pain, we all have unmet need. And as we take care of those things, we can all be connected regardless. Absolutely. And we can all develop that superpower. Mm -hmm. exactly. I like superpowers. It takes a little bit of time, yeah. but everybody yeah. can. I do like superpowers too. It makes it so much more automatic and so much easier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Laura. And thank you everyone for joining us on this episode of Triggered and True. And we look forward to uh, all being together again very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of Triggered and True. We hope that you enjoyed it. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, go to triggeredandtrue.com, scroll down to the bottom of the page and click ask. And if you would like to learn more about the Compassion Method, be sure to check out the Compassion Method Master Course, which can be purchased at compassionmethod.net. And as a podcast listener, you qualify for a $50 discount, which can be obtained by typing in the coupon code podcast50. Again, that's compassionmethod.net, coupon code podcast50. Thank you again. Goodbye.